This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Jonah Hosteller, and I welcome you to worship this morning at College Mennonite Church. Wherever you are and whoever you are, no matter your successes or mistakes this week, we are glad you are here worshiping with us this morning as we explore God's Sabbath call. Our lives are full of activities, news stories of violence, notifications, errands to run, bills to pay, and so many things to keep our minds occupied and our bodies busy. But today, may our minds be open and clear as we intentionally meet God here and worship together. Please join me in our call to worship on the screens. My hands will guide our breaths and we will join in voice together at the end. We come this day having been tossed about on the sea of life, feeling overwhelmed by the waves of time and needs. But today is Sabbath, a set apart time. Let go of the demands of this week, rest in the peace of this sanctuary. The needs will still be there when we return from this set-apart time, but now is the time to rest. God, help us to understand the resting time. Give us courage to be at peace and grow in your love. Slow us down. Amen. Number 701, you are all we have, 701.
Psalms 23, verses 1 through 6, says this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The house of the Lord. Sometimes I believe that that's our bodies, his creation. Let us pray. Heavenly creator, We come before you, asking you to teach us how to take those deep breaths and to be still. We ask that you teach us to place our complete trust in you in this world where there's constant movement. We ask that you help us. Help us, Lord, to learn that our bodies are your sacred places that you live within us. We pray for our congregation as we learn to do this together. We pray for our congregation as we navigate and accept changes. Help us be certain that you are in control. We pray for our church leaders and all of those who work in your vineyard. Give us wisdom to steward and shepherd everything that you entrust us with. We pray for our children as they grow. We bless them, O oh Lord. We pray for our neighbors we pray for our local governing bodies, our police persons, our fire persons, our health workers, the administrators, the professors, the teachers, the store workers, and even those who repair our cars. And everyone else in our communities that make it a better place to live. We pray for our governing bodies, especially the ones in this nation. We pray for the end of the political violence, not just here, but in other places. We pray for our future leaders. We pray that they lead well. We pray that they lead for everyone. For the rich and the poor. For those who are born here and those who are foreign. 
We pray for those who are hungry and thirsty, that they may be fed. We pray for those who are suffering losses because of climate change. We pray that you help them. We pray for comfort for those of us who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Help us to accept it. We pray for the loved ones of those who lost their loved ones last night as a result of political violence. This morning we pray for our world. We pray for peace. We pray for righteousness. We pray that it rolls like a river. We pray for the end of senselessness. We pray, we pray without ceasing. We pray. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. And we, your holy people, say, Amen. I now invite the children to come forward to the circle for children's time as we sing from Voices Together, num number 511. Come on, children, to the gospel, peace. Good morning. I have a story for you about when I was a child. So when I was growing up, Saturdays were the day of preparing for Sabbath. I did not like some parts of preparing for Sabbath because it included a list of chores for me for getting our house clean, but there was a part of it that I loved. Every Saturday afternoon, my mom and I would go to Dylan's, which is the Kansas version of Kroger. And we would take along our Dylan's cup, which we could fill with pop for 25 cents. And then my mom and I would drink that as we walked around the grocery store and got all of our groceries for the week. And at the end of that shopping trip was the really fun part when we would get our food for our Sabbath meal. In my household, every Saturday night was kind of the same meal. It was very simple. My mom and I would get croissants and the little Vortman's cookies that came out of the, the bins that you, you bought by weight, and different deli meats and cheeses, and I got to choose a lot of those things and whatever fruits and vegetables were in season. Then we would go home and my mom and I would put those on platters and get them ready for the table. Now my dad and my sister also had some work to do to prepare for the Sabbath. They are both very good at making things look nice. So their job was to make Sabbath beautiful. They would set the table with the good dishes. They would go outside even in the dead of winter and find something that was growing outside or something that was found out in our backyard, and they would make a centerpiece for the table with that, and they would put a candle at each person's place. 
because that way no one argued about who got to blow it out. When everything was prepared for the Sabbath and when the sun was going down, my family would gather around the table and we would light our candles. So you can go ahead and turn your candle on. And we would say our Sabbath prayer. Then we would eat our meal together. Sabbath for my household when I was growing up was about eating a simple meal together with candlelight and reading scripture together and just taking a deep breath together around our table. God's people have been preparing for the Sabbath for a long time. The first story that we read of preparing for the Sabbath is about manna and quail. Do you all remember that story of manna and quail in the Bible? The people cried out to God because they were hungry, and God responded by giving daily bread. And they gathered it every morning, and if they gathered too much, it would rot. Remember that? So if they gathered more and tried to save it for the next day, it would rot. But once a week, a miracle would happen. They would gather enough for two days, and it would not rot the second day. On the sixth day, they gathered enough for the next day, and the seventh day, they did not gather any manna, because that day was the Sabbath. (laughs) Oh, yep. Now you're remembering that. I think part of the joy of being the Sabbath people is preparing for the Sabbath. Preparing for the Sabbath is not just grown-ups' work. It's everyone's work. So I invite you to think about how you will prepare for the Sabbath. This month, we're talking a lot about Sabbath keeping. And then in August, when we kind of move on to a different worship series, uh, don't throw candles, you might start a fire. This In in August, we'll start talking about something else in worship, but that's actually when our Sabbath challenge begins. So, for three months, we have a challenge for everyone to practice being a Sabbath people together and find our routines and our rituals. Exactly what we do for that will look different in different households. We've got a whole bunch of ideas out on a dry erase board out in the hallway. But I want to challenge you to start talking with your grown-ups in your households at home. Start talking about how your household is going to practice Sabbath keeping and how each of you will help your family prepare for the Sabbath and keep the Sabbath. Because you know what? If just one person in the household cares about it and is making it happen, it feels like a burden instead of a joy. So start talking about how you're going to do that together. Now, at the end of our Sabbath meal when I was a child, we each blew out our own candle. So you can blow as hard as you want. It's not going to do anything. But you could try turning it off. (laughs) Eliana's going to (laughs) try. And you get to take this with you. So take this home with you, and maybe you'll incorporate it into how your family, how your household celebrates Sabbath, or maybe you'll just keep it as a reminder of, oh yeah, we're going to have that conversation and start thinking about how we will be Sabbath keepers. May God bless you as you learn to be a Sabbath people. You may go back to your seats. Oh wait, you may not go back to your seats yet. I have a job for you. Come up here, take some of these, and got to listen in the sermon, because at a certain point in the sermon, I am going to ask you all to help pass these out to the people around you, okay? So don't fold them into airplanes. Just be ready to help pass them out. We're going to sing number 437, 437, The Lord is My Light.
Our scripture for today comes from Exodus 16, 22 through 26. And we are going to read this together. So we will say, side one is this section and the balcony, and side two is the center and this section. Okay? Read with me. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much food, two omers apiece. When all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is the day the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake, and boil what you want to boil, and all that is left over put aside to be kept until morning. So they put it aside until morning, just as Moses commanded them, and it did not rot, and there were no maggots in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. The word of the Lord. The people cried out to God. They were hungry. Their bodies needed food. For generations, those bodies had been enslaved. They had been ruled by a master who had no interest in those bodies' well-being. Ruled by a master who fed those bodies only so that they could do more labor. A master who valued them only for their output, for what they could do. For generations, the people had been commodified. Their worth was in what their bodies could do. And their lives were endless labor. And now, freed from endless labor, but not freed from trauma, they cried out to God. And God responded. God heard their spoken need for food for their hungry bodies. And God responded with manna and quail, daily bread, raining down from the heavens to be gathered every day. Sustenance. But God also heard that unspoken need. God heard the cry that came from their cores that they couldn't even articulate. Their need for wholeness, their need for rest, for trust in a creator, the need for an identity that was not rooted in commodified bodies, that was not rooted in what they could do in their output. God heard that need. And God responded with Sabbath. A day every week to remember that their value is not in what they could do, but in who their creator was. God heard their cries. God understood that sustenance of the mind and of the spirit go together that these are inseparable. And in God's one act of the rhythm of manna and quail, the people's bodies and food and work was all decommodified. Mennonite theologian Nate Stuckey wrote a book called Wrestling with Rest. The book focuses especially on teenagers' need for Sabbath. 
Nate spends some time with today's passage, and here's one of the things that he has to say about it. Quote, humankind's truest identity cannot be found in endless labor, but is found instead in a God who provides not only food to sustain the body, but also rest and space for the flourishing of identities founded on something greater and deeper than human effort and productivity. End quote. So in other words, commodification of land and human output dishonors our truest selves. God's relationship with the people includes complete provision for their tummies and for their souls. We cry out to God, right? Most of us have full bellies, but we cry out from other symptoms. Our bodies and our minds cry out with ill health. We cry out in, exha- in exhaustion, in anxiety, in feelings of worthlessness or helplessness. We cry out from situations of trauma. Commodification of humans, it's not a new story. And it's not a story that's over. We commodify bodies and knowledge and time. We value ourselves and others for what we know, for what we can do. We value time for how much we can accomplish during it. Whether it's enough time or not enough time is based on what can happen in it, right? On what we can do, on what the output can be in that span of time. Our cultural mindset is to value human bodies and minds for output and efficiency and contributions, and that's not new and it's not going away. We've been formed for generations in the mindset that our value lies in our output. And we have ill health. And we cry out to God. God hears us. God responds. God hears our spoken needs and responds with medical professionals and friends and beautiful creation. God responds to our unspoken needs too. With Sabbath. God's relationship with us, with humanity throughout all of history, with creation throughout all of history, includes complete provision. Food for our tummies, rest for our souls. The invitation to Sabbath keeping is an invitation to weekly remember, as in put back together, our identity. It's an invitation to every week remember who we are and who God is. On the Sabbath, we recover our reliance on God, our identity in God, rather than reliance on ourselves and identity in all of the things. Our family has a a weekly Sabbath ritual that has evolved, changed over the years, and one thing that has evolved with it is this curated playlist, our Sabbath playlist. It was in the newsletters on Friday. Uh, it's it's a, a little bit of a snapshot of our family throughout the years and how we see Sabbath, so there's a little, like, Salty the Singing Songbook on it. Um, but there's also this, this song that I keep coming back to over these last couple of months. It's called That Shabos Feeling. And it's to the tune of Can't Stop the Feeling, if you know what that song is. It's by this group called 613, which is 
I guess I would describe it as a, a Jewish a cappella boy band. Um, it's, it's a very silly song, but it's profound. <laughs> and I keep going back to it and finding these little nuggets in it. So one of the phrases is, everybody's free from worries and plans. There's another one, in every city I feel at home. Think about that, one day a week, no matter where you are, you're coming home because you're part of the Sabbath people. And then this one, and I promise I won't sing it. My children would be mortified if I started singing this song. Took God six days to make this beautiful world whole. Then, on the seventh, God slowed his roll, and that's why we take one day to refresh our souls. Again, took God six days to make this beautiful world whole. Then on the seventh, God slowed his roll. And that's why we take one day to refresh our souls. Like God, we do all the things for six days. And all the things are making this beautiful world whole. Collecting manna is good. It's good work. It needs to happen. There's nothing wrong with collecting manna. All of the things, the tasks, the activities, most of them, are good. Keep them up. And often those things are part of making this beautiful world whole. For six days, we join God in making this beautiful world whole. But on the seventh, we join God in slowing our roll, which is slang for just slowing down a little bit, and take a day to refresh our souls. To remember that our value is not in our output, that we are not commodified minds and bodies. We are humans, created in the image of God, and our identity is in our Creator. I'm going to invite you to join me in an exercise because this month is kind of all about getting to some practicalities. So children, <laughs> and Becky, um, <laughs> if you could pass those out, try to get one to each person. So you're going to have to kind of book it around. We might need one child from the balcony to come down here to help pass out down here. Thank you all. So as these are being passed out, I have some questions. What are you tempted to root your identity in? Where do you find your worth? I'll ask this a few more ways. What spins in your mind as you fall asleep at night? What is it that occupies your energy, your resources, your time, your attention? Where does all of that go? If you get stuck on something, what are you often getting stuck on? What are you tempted to root your identity in? Where do you find your worth? Your responses are probably some really good things. For example, your vocation, right? The, the, the ways that you've been called to live your life. That's probably a lot of what is bubbling up for you. These are good things. Collecting manna is good. Don't forget that collecting manna is a really good activity, okay? In our household, we came up with some things, and I won't attach names to these except my own, but you can figure them out. We came up with fixing things, Legos, gaining knowledge, and mine was planning and feeding people, right? I like planning 
I think that my ability to plan well is a gift. I get lots of pats on the back if I do it well. When I don't plan well, I feel like a total failure. I love to bake and cook and feed people. And when I don't do it well, I feel kind of worthless. I plan and I feed people. That's a lot of my identity. What are you tempted to root your identity in? Where do you find your worth? Okay, now on your bookmarks, raise your hand if you still need a bookmark. Oh, (laughs) Becky needs a bookmark, and that's funny because she was passing them out. Becky, are you a helper? (laughs) All right. And children, make sure you get one too, okay? If you have extras, you can decide if you want to keep them or give them to Zeph because he can give them back to me. So fill it out. So for example, mine would be six days you shall plan and feed people. But on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. So grab one of those pencils that's in the pew and fill it out. This is, it's um, not just a mind exercise, it's an actual exercise. In other words, whatever you fill in the blank is what you rest from on Sabbath. That's your manna. It's a really good thing that you hit the pause button on once a week so that it can return to its rightful place in your sense of self. For that one day of the week, set aside the thing that can tip over into commodifying your mind and your body. And in its place, invite God to make your heart sing. Maybe God will draw you into a different activity. Maybe God will make your heart sing in a walk in nature or in the fellowship of the family of God or in scripture or in poetry. Maybe God will make your heart sing in silence. Doing is good. Collecting manna is good. Creating, helping, fixing, learning, exercising, serving. These activities are gifts from God. But your ability to do is not what gives you value. You are not a commodity. Your value is simple. You are a beloved child of God, created in the image of God. So once a week, stop trying to make this beautiful world whole, slow your roll, and let God refresh your soul. We'll join now in singing Voices Together 172, God Calls You Good. It's new but simple. Let's sing it together.
Let us join together in another Sabbath practice, the giving of our tithes and offerings. Let us care for one another as God has cared for us. As you come forward, I invite you to turn in voices together, number 760, Take My Life That I May Be. Give with a glad and joyful heart. Join me in prayer. God, we have given back freely what you have entrusted to us. I pray that you will guide us to use this well, making this beautiful world whole. And God, I pray that you will give us the compassion and grace for ourselves, for others, for all of your creation, to pause and breathe and rest in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn now to Voices Together 830. Stand in body or spirit as we sing, Go My Children.
few quick announcements before the benediction. We are gathering ideas from everyone on ways to keep the Sabbath. Visit the Sabbath People Board in the hallway and add your own ideas on how to keep the Sabbath. The Seeker Sunday School class trip to Luke Gasho's Gardens is being called off for today and will be rescheduled later. And finally, the Community Life Commission has been providing a name tag sign up in the main hallway for the last couple of months. Wearing your name tag is a simple way to build community, relate to one another, and help all to feel welcome in this space. The commission invites you to wear your name tags each Sunday, and if you don't have one, you are welcome to sign up at the table. Max Lucado offers this reminder. You are valuable because you exist, not because of what you do or what you have done, but simply because you are. As you go from this space, may you carry this reminder as you pause and practice the Sabbath. You are a beloved child of God. Spirit of God, go with us as a reminder that we are valuable in the way you have created us as your beloved children. Go in peace. Thank you.